there, beloved saints. I'm sorry I have not put out any content this week. We have just been swamped with appointments, but <clears throat> I am going to be on Sister Lisa's program tonight. Uh, her channel is the number four, the Most High Jesus, is one word, channel. And she has come to me with something that concerns her, but it was actually brought to my attention several weeks ago. Um, actually, longer than that. So I'm kind of combining two concerns I had. One is this doctrine of reprobation, uh, that if a person is gay or has homosexual tendencies, that that somehow means they're reprobate and therefore, alas, somehow unsavable, which is a false doctrine. We'll look at that. Uh, I don't know why Christians take that particular work of the flesh and turn it into something unforgivable. I, I don't understand that at all. It's just another form of limited atonement. Um, now, this uh, video is not about how a Christian should be living. Uh, we believe in sound doctrine. Salvation is only the beginning. Salvation's a rescue. You're rescued by what Christ did. You receive it. You get the Holy Spirit. And then the Christian life, it's a, it's a whole relationship with the Lord until you leave this body of death. So uh, that is a whole separate issue. So we are all for living a Christian life the way God dictates we should be living and walking in newness of life to walk out his will for us as we are saved unto good works. But that is not what this video is about. Uh, the other issue is there are blanket statements being made that are causing people suicidal ideation, um, telling them that there's no such thing as a gay Christian. Um, and in one sense, that's true because we are not identified with the sin of the flesh or the failure of our flesh. We are identified by the righteousness of God in Christ. That's our true identity our permanent positional standing by faith in Jesus, okay? But if you're talking about if a person gets saved, that all of a sudden they will no longer have these desires, well, that's not true either. Paul tells us once you're saved, you now have the Holy Spirit. He will guide you correctly to live the law of liberty in love and grace, and grace does teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. But that doesn't just include that. It includes other things like gossip and apathy and pride and other things people forget. So there is the sense of a person growing once they're saved, and that's important. That's important doctrine. But we don't mix that up with what gets us or keeps us saved. So this is very sad because Jesus tells us all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not a just man upon the earth uh, that's upright as sinneth not. Who can say I've made my heart clean? I'm free from sin. Nobody that's still in the, the flesh. Even Paul said, uh, not as though I had already attained or either was already perfect. So he knows he will not be perfect until he leaves this carnal body right? But we are told to reckon ourselves dead to sin and to the law, because this flesh is dead. We're to reckon it dead, already dead. That's why Paul says he dies daily. Now, with that being said, we're going to divide here what the birth is. The new birth does not mean that you don't have struggle in the flesh anymore. And, and I see this is quite dangerous, because if you don't know you have a battle, how can you fight it? Denying there is a battle is ridiculous. We're supposed to put on the full armor of God. Why do you need to put on the armor of God if you're just perfect automatically? And that's not true. We're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit. So it's possible to grieve the Holy Spirit. We're told in Romans too, once you're saved, you have a choice. You can feed the dead man, the old man, the dead flesh, and live carnally, which brings death, or you can listen to the Spirit. Because when you were lost, you didn't have the Spirit. You just had the law and the flesh 
uh, can't achieve it. It's not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be, right? So we don't get law focused. We're Christ focused for victory. So grace is how we obtain a better walk with the Lord and victory against sinful things in our lives as we grow in grace through the milk of the word. We're supposed to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, not in condemnation. So this is an inaccurate statement. Just because someone's sin is different than yours, why, why do we pick out one group of people to condemn? So first of all, let's look at the verses on being reprobate. And we're going to look at the difference between uh, the saved and the unsaved. The unsaved are the unrighteous. That's why in the Corinthian church, he fusses at the church for taking their court cases against one another before the unjust. Unsaved men. Why are you taking your cases? Uh, law. You go to law against a brother in front of the unjust. Don't you know the unrighteous, the unjust guys aren't going to inherit the kingdom? You're going to judge angels one day. So why are you taking your stuff before them? And he lists what these unrighteous, unjust, unbelieving uh, judges or men do and how they live. And then says, hey, and such were some of you, but you were washed. So you should know your identity in Christ now. You don't identify with the flesh birth, the birth of the first Adam. You identify with your rebirth, the second birth, the spiritual birth in the second Adam, which is your birth in Christ. So we'll look at this, okay? Um, let's go. The, see, the one born of God is the spirit, not the flesh. One born of God doth not commit sin. The seed of Christ is in him, and he cannot sin. He is the seed of Christ who cannot sin. So we have to distinguish the spirit man, the new man, from the old man, the flesh, who we are told is dead. So we're supposed to reckon that guy dead. And in our minds, die daily. It's the cross and the power of his resurrection that gives us the strength to crucify the world to ourselves. Okay? So we see in John, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We're told elsewhere, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. What's that? Anyone with just the first birth cannot inherit the kingdom. Flesh and blood will not inherit. You have to be reborn spiritually, and one day you'll be given a glorified immortal body. Now, that's flesh and bone, but it doesn't say anything about blood. So that's a glorified body. Paul talks about the celestial versus terrestrial bodies he talks about uh different he uses the sun and the stars as an example of how things have different glory so is it with the resurrection of the dead terrestrial bodies have one glory but the glorified body has much more glory right so um we're gonna look here and so he's telling him except a man be born again it's born of the spirit you cannot see the kingdom of god because if you just have this birth in the flesh, you can't inherit the kingdom with this body. That's why this body has to die. But Paul says we're to reckon it already dead. Like, that's what water baptism represents. It's a symbol. When we were baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit, that we died, were buried, and rose again with Christ. Right? That's what that represents. And Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit. Okay, born of water is the first birth, the physical birth. And of the Spirit is the second birth. See, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born is flesh is flesh. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That's why he mentions born of water first, of flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit, the second birth. See how he divides it here? Born of water is the, sometimes they say a oh, 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 mother's water breaks, right? Born of water, that's the first birth, the flesh. Second birth is of the spirit. That's why he says that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. 
right? Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell where it cometh or whether it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? Art thou a master of Israel? Knowest not these things? And so he goes into how it's done. Just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, so much I be lifted up and draw them in unto me. See, they looked upon the bronze serpent when they were bitten by poisonous snakes. And they said, look upon this image with faith and you will be healed and not die. Well, that's a picture of Jesus wearing our sin, the serpent, in his own body, becoming sin who knew no sin. We look upon him with faith, knowing that we won't die. And it's the same thing. We look upon the cross with faith and will never die. So, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds shall be reproved. See, we have to admit we're a sinner in need of a Savior. A lot of, pe a lot of people don't want to go... I'm helpless. I'm not good. Like, I don't care how good you think you're living. God, God doesn't owe you. That would make God a debtor to you. If you think it's Jesus plus how good you're living is keeping you saved, you're a work salvationist. You believe somehow something you're doing, the way they word it is very clever, but it's still about them. God doesn't owe you eternal life because you lived like a good Christian. That is not salvation. Eternal life is a free gift based on the merits of Jesus. And you either believe he did that for you and you have eternal life or you do not. Because that's how you have the Holy Spirit. Because you trusted in Christ. You trusted him. Right? So we see here there's two births the flesh, and the spirit. And many people misunderstand, as Peter says, some things Paul says are hard to be understood, and they are unlearned, unstable, rest them, like they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. So we'll see in Romans how he explains when you're law-focused, uh, it brings condemnation to you, but when you're spirit-focused, it gives you victory, and it brings you life, right? And how we're supposed to reckon ourselves dead, dead to sin, dead to the law, and married to Christ, all right? So, it's, it's wrong to say that if you're a Christian, you won't have these tendencies or you won't do this or that. You still have a choice whether to serve the Lord or disobey the Lord. The Holy Spirit does not force us to do what's right. The love of Christ constraineth us. We should do it because he first loved us, all right? If we don't, if he teaches us, he's trying to save us from uh, bad consequences and damage to the church and even possible death. But if we continue in some rebellion, we're chastised. It says that. Nobody is comfortable in it. Nobody. Nobody's just okay with it. They, they, they know something. Their spiritual life is going to be affected in some way. Um, so. It's wrong to say that if you're really saved, you won't do this or that. Because we see places where Peter says, let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as a busybody in other men's matters and an evildoer. But if you do suffer as a Christian, suffer for the cause of Christ. So it's obvious Christians are capable of doing terrible things just like anybody else is. The difference is we're not condemned with the world in the end who doesn't believe. We suffer chastisement and or loss of reward. We can also pull, God will never leave us or forsake us, but we can affect fellowship with God because of condemnation and not have a boldness to come to his throne of grace for help in the time of need when we feel condemned. So <clears throat> it's wrong to say if you're saved, you won't do this, that, or this because you still have the old man 
Now, Paul tells us how to get victory, but if you don't have that mindset, you'll never grow. So, it tells us here, let's look at the first and second birth again. For This is in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam, all die. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. All right? So we see that through Adam, all die. So if you're in the first Adam, you're going to suffer the second death. You need to be born again so that you can have eternal life in Christ. All right? If you go over to 1 Corinthians where I was telling you about the unrighteous will not inherit. Now, this is taken out of context. He's talking about these. I have a video on it, so just type that up. Uh, either the verse number or the unrighteous won't inherit. It's verse by verse, explains it clearly. Uh, so he says, you know, he fusses at him. Why are you taking your brother to court in front of an unjust judge, an unsaved man? Don't you know those guys, the unrighteous, shall not inherit the kingdom? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. Now, a Christian is not defined by works of the flesh anymore. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are saints. Paul is constantly telling us that, telling us our identity in Christ, our permanent position. It's our daily state that changes. Now, that is what good sound doctrine does. It helps you in your daily state line up with the truth of who God says you are in Christ. All right? So, when it says neither fornicators are or can a Christian fornicate? Yes, they can. Matter of fact, they're being rebuked for commonly having fornication reported among them. And that's some of the rebuke here to this church. But he's not talking about them being the unrighteous. Do you understand? He's saying, here's the works that the unsaved man does. And if you're walking in flesh, this is the type of stuff you'll exhibit. But if you're saved and you have the spirit, and you're walking in the spirit, here's the things that the spirit will manifest. That's how you can tell which one you're walking in, the old man or the new man, right? So to say this, it's not possible for a Christian, especially a carnal babe in Christ, to walk in the old man is wrong. They can walk in the old man, although we're told not to, okay? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, everybody's guilty of that one, nor drunkards, nor revilers, fighting, arguing, strife, uh, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this is the one they usually leave off. And such were some of you. But what changed? You were washed. The blood of Jesus made you not that person anymore. So shall you continue, continue in that behavior like the unsaved man? Absolutely not. Don't you know you're not yours anymore? You were bought with a price, right? Ye are washed. Ye are sanctified, set apart. Ye are justified, declared righteous, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And by what? Because you decided you were going to start being good now? No, by the Spirit of our God. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. That's why. You believed on Christ. What he did made you washed, justified, sanctified. And it goes on and says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Now he's talking to saved people here. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. So these people were carnal. He said, I come to you as carnal as unto babes in Christ. They were fighting, taking each other to court. One guy was having an affair with his father's wife. There was common fornication among them. Also going to uh, idolatrous temples and offering things to their idols. All kinds of terrible stuff these people were doing, but they were saved, all right? So he's trying to tell them who they are in Christ. Their new birth makes them belong to God. So they shouldn't be joining their body uh, to a harlot because... We're part of the Christ body, and it's holy. You see, we're the temple of God. Shall I then, then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. So, if these people were capable of, they were saved, they had the spirit, 
but they were still tempted to fornicate and were fornicating, why would you say a saved person can't uh, commit any other kind of fornication? Of course they can. They shouldn't. And this is not about justifying. It's about having right doctrine. Some of these people, it's their particular burden of their flesh. Jesus doesn't deny salvation to someone because of what type of sin it is. I, I don't get this. They, they'll admit murderers can be saved. But for some reason, this trips people up. And it, it doesn't make sense to say if you're really Christian, then uh, it's not possible you do that. Yes, it is possible. It, it's, it's frowned upon, and we're told not to. Uh, but to say that's not possible makes a person feel like they're outside of the grace of God. How is that good news to someone? And I don't know why everybody wants this to be bad news. It's hypocrisy. They're not sinless either. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, all right? So these people belong to God. He's telling them, don't do it because you don't belong to you anymore. Is it possible that they can do it? Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. If you go over to Romans 8, it tells us, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Those are trying to be justified by the law, still in the first man, not reborn in the second man. But says, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, how, how does the spirit of God dwell in us? So it tells us in Ephesians, in whom we trusted. We believe, we heard the gospel, we trusted in Christ, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So, we get the spirit because we believed the record of Jesus. That his blood paid our sin debt, and because he died for us and he rose again, we too will rise again just like he did. Now, Paul tells us that we should walk in newness of life. We should walk in the power of his resurrection right now in this life, but that he had not even attained perfection. Nobody's perfect until they're in this glorified body. It says all, everybody's groaning. Everything is groaning for uh, a new, new body, for creation to be renewed. All right, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. Did you hear that? The body is dead. For Christians, this flesh, yeah, it's walking around. We're, we're considered already dead because this is good, de good as dead. It, it, it doesn't inherit the kingdom. We're going to step out of this right into a glorified body. But this body, this flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom. And we are not in the flesh. So we shouldn't be walking like we are. Okay? But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, see, because of this promise of eternal life that you have because of Jesus, the down payment was the Holy Spirit. You're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you, through the Spirit, do mortify deeds of the body, you shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So everyone with the Holy Spirit is a child of God. For you have not received the bondage, the receive, receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba. Father, the Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, they were under terrible persecution, and he's trying to motivate them and edify them. This goes into helping them deal with the persecution that's coming, that the promise that we have before us is so much better than whatever they're going to endure. All right, so um, it tells us clearly that there's a difference between the flesh and the spirit, and we are not in the flesh. We've been born of God, 
in the spirit. We're in the second Adam, the last Adam, Jesus, not Adam. All right. So it's just wrong to say that a person won't commit this or that sin if they're really Christian. Now, we implore you not to, but you don't get victory over sinful habits in your life by focusing on law and condemnation. You get victory by growing in grace through the milk of the word, knowing who you are, who God says you are as his child, who you are in Christ. Paul says, I die daily. This is a daily battle, a daily choice we make. So what happens if a Christian doesn't do that? Well, that's what fellowship with one another, reading the scriptures, prayer, relationship with the Lord, all of that helps us grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But let's say a person falls away from that or never gets properly discipled. You're stuck. You're stuck. Because the more your law focused, the strength of sin is the law, not grace. That's why this whole accusation makes no sense. Because the more you know who you are in Christ, your eyes are always on him, knowing his great love for you. That's where the victory it comes from. So knowing that we have the promise of eternal life, because God who cannot lie promised it for the world began. He wants us to have a heart in full assurance of faith. He did it all. He died once for all, we're perfected forever in him. So we need to abide in grace in order to grow and move forward. Condemnation, legalism does nothing to help people. And it's another gospel. It's a false gospel. If you tell people, if you tell an alcoholic, in order to be saved, you got to stop drinking to be saved, then salvation is by works of not being a drunkard. And we all still fall short every day. And that's our righteousness. I don't think people understand the difference between the gift of righteousness, God's imputed righteousness, which is not performance, by the way. Just like Jesus didn't perform sin to become our sin, we're not performing righteousness to become God's righteousness. It's a gift of righteousness put on our account. Just like our sin was put on him, he puts his righteousness on us. That's our permanent positional standing in Christ. And everything stems from there. And that's how we grow. So to say there's no such thing as a gay Christian, well, in one sense it's true because we are not defined by works of the flesh anymore. We are not in the flesh. But the other, the way they mean it is not true. Because a Christian is just like anybody else in the sense that they still have flesh and desires of the flesh. But we're told how to overcome that with the help of the Holy Spirit, and we can, but condemnation doesn't do it. And denying the gospel is also the wrong way to go, because now you got somebody fighting, fighting, fighting by their own willpower and their flesh. They'll either get puffed up, or they'll get completely hopeless, and both are really bad. So now let's look at the second thing here. Uh, we're going to look at the verses on a reprobate now. They're telling them that they're because they're gay or have gay desires or whatever, that they're a reprobate, meaning their minds are so far from God that he's just giving them over to it and they'll never be saved. And that and that's nonsense. Let's find out what these people were reprobate for. And it had nothing to do with that sin. All right. For the invisible things of him. This is uh, Romans chapter one, 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Okay, so why did he give them over to a reprobate mind? Because they worshipped idols. They weren't thankful. They didn't worship the true and living creator. 
They made images like man and birds and bees and bowed themselves down towards them. That's why. And let's look at what, whenever he gives them over to something, he gives them over to all sin, not just that one. All right. So that's why they were given a reprobate mind. They were idolaters. It doesn't say a believer who trusts Christ is made to reprobate. That's ridiculous. So, wherefore, wherefore what? Because they worshipped idols and didn't know God and didn't worship him as God, but worshipped idols. It tells you right there. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Again, confirms because they worship the creature rather than the creator. They were idolaters. They didn't know God. They didn't trust in Jesus. They didn't trust in the living God. They had idols. This is why they were turned over. Okay. For this cause, there's the cause for this cause. Worshipping the creature rather than the creator. Worshipping idols, it tells you right here. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet or worthy or appropriate. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Why did he give them over? Because they were idolaters, okay? They did not worship the true God and didn't want to, okay? There's another clue, did not want to. All right. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. That's everything. That's everything. Any kind of unrighteousness. Fornication. Wickedness. Just general wickedness. Covetousness. Desiring what other people have. Maliciousness. Just nasty. Backbiting. Full of envy. Murder debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. How many Christians love to whisper and gossip? There's some right now just telling flat out lies about me, flat out lies, but then we'll say that I promote sin. So it's just lies and hypocrisy, people. Backbiters, that's pretending to be one thing, and then when they turn their back, talking about them. Haters of God, despiteful proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Is everyone that's disobedient to their parent automatically a reprobate? Of course not. So why do you take one sin out of this list, pull it out and say, well, if you have this sin, it just means you're reprobate and God, God can't save you. He's turned his back on you. It's ridiculous. Boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Wherefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. Thank you. It's like they don't even read the verse that comes after. You know why? Because there's another chapter, but it's a continuing thought. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O oh man. They don't read that part of this. So it's, it breaks my heart that they're saying this. I got babies on the verge of suicide. I have lost a viewer to suicide. I, I, didn't, I didn't get to them in time. Uh, and, uh, the family has, has thanked me for being there for the family, but I can't tell you how sick I am over this false teaching. People are dying. You know, it might not be a big deal to you, 
But I wasn't kidding when I said the the false gospel made me, you know, be without hope. I mean, I did it to my wrist. I, I was serious. I'm assuming these people are too. When they just give up, they give up. They're tired of the pain and the torment. You know, good news. It's good news. It's the greatest news ever that God loved you. You were hopeless. You were lost. And God did everything through his son to save you. He paid the debt you could never pay. He rescued you. He is a savior. He is mighty to save. But that's just part one. Having eternal life is the greatest promise ever. But that's the beginning of our relationship and our adventure with the Lord. So how we walk and grow in the Lord is a whole separate issue here. I'm talking just simple salvation. I don't know what about free gift not by works of righteousness, for him that worketh not but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Just through uh, Adam, all men die. Through Christ, all can live. Just depends on which birth you're in. Flesh and blood can't inherit. So if you're still in the first birth, you need to be born again. Saved, born of the Spirit, putting your trust in what Christ did. He promises eternal life for all who trust in him, what he's done. And I, I really hope people stop preaching this nonsense. It's completely against the truth of the gospel. You know, I, I don't know how this mess got started. And again, I'll be accused of promoting sin, but everyone that knows me knows I would never say God is okay with us doing any of these things, any of them, any kind of uh, lifestyle that would give Jesus a bad name, including hypocrisy and having no compassion, no mercy for people that suffer. That to me is inexcusable. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. Let's read that verse again. Whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. They that demand you keep the law, they themselves don't keep it. They think they do. They don't. None of us keep it perfectly. Even the thought of foolishness is sin. To know good and to do it not, it is sin to us. The sin is not the issue. The sin was dealt with on the cross. The, it, like they say, it's not the sin issue, it's a son issue. Do you have the son of God or not? Because he is our righteousness. He is our salvation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. And so we've got to be born again first. Then let God worry about getting him on track. And we're supposed to help one another grow here and grow in grace, not, not set people aside and condemn them. If they, if they are saved and they have put their trust in the Lord, we're to treat them as a, as a brother and to help them grow, not set them aside. It's, it's very, very concerning for me. It's false, false, false. The people were given to, over to a reprobate mind to commit not just that sin, but all of these, including gossiping, whispering, disobedience, envying, backbiting, gossip. He gave them over to all that. Would you say somebody that gossips or talks behind somebody's back, it must mean they're reprobate? Of course not. So why would you take one sin out of that list when it clearly says, such were some of you, but you were washed, justified, sanctified in the name of our by the Spirit of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Good news, people. Good news. God bless.